both in terms of politics, economics, foreign relations, but also what's going on in the broader neighborhood, in this case, particularly Central Asia. You have the bios of uh, our three speakers, so I won't spend too much time since we only have an hour. I'll go and give you a very brief introduction uh, in the order uh, that the speakers will uh, speak. Uh, we'll start with uh, Kamir Alai. He's a co-founder and co-president of the Institute for International Health and Education. Kamir is an expert in health policy in Iran and in the region. He's the author of dozens of scientific papers. And I know some of uh, his work has created, uh, if you look up his background, created uh, some problems for him, unfortunately, back in his home country of Iran, but he is now good and safe with us in the United States. Uh, speaker number two is Hajir Rahman Dodd. Uh, Hajir is a Mitsubishi career development professor and associate professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the Sloan School of Management. Uh, Hajir has published in diverse journals. His particular area of expertise is also public health, including obesity, depression dynamics, and comparing different modeling methodologies in uh, application to uh, also epidemics, uh, among others. And last, we'll turn to uh, Navbahar Emamova. Uh, Navbahar is a journalist at Voice of America Uzbek service here in Washington, DC. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in covering Central Asia. I have been following her work and always enjoyed it. Uh, she focuses on regional issues in Central Asia. And we would very much like to hear from Navbahar uh, what is going on in that part of the world since the news in terms of COVID-19 has, at least to begin with, been spar uh, sparse. And um, we look forward to see what is going on, what's the latest in, in that part of the world. Um, so that's the order of the presentations today. And thank you again for joining us. I look forward to the conversation. I'm going to be very brief. We only want uh, have one hour. I know we need to have a hard stop as uh, one of the panelists needs to get on with another uh, commitment. So let me turn over quickly to uh, Kamiar and ask my first question of Kamiar. I very much would like to give um, you uh, the opportunity and love to hear your thoughts in terms of your assessment of where we are today, sort of uh, halfway almost through April. I. I woke up this morning and I listened to parts of the speech by Ayatollah Khamenei, the Iranian Supreme Leader, which gives you the impression that almost everything's good, everything's under control. Uh, he politicized it again. It's this sort of tit for tat. We're doing better than the West uh, and so forth. And on the other hand, you had President Hassan Rouhani, who, if I remember uh, what he said correctly, he said, you know what, we need to let people back to work. Um, what is 2 million people dying versus 30 million people not having jobs and what would happen to them? To me, that was a political statement. Um, is, am I right in thinking there's too much politics still going on in this battle against COVID-19 in Iran? Cam, your floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I am so honored. You have to unmute yourself. It's unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's we still can hear you. I hope can you, you can hear, hear us. <laughs> it's in the uh, right, on the left hand corner. Hear you. I'm unmuted. We hear you. Maybe okay. it's just me. Good. I can't Maybe hear. Can. Okay. Your... So I'm so honored to be here. So, as you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> Iran <clears throat> politicized non political health concern. If you look at the uh, history over the past three months, you know, where there were a lot of, you know, advised by, you know, health experts to, you know, cancel direct flights from China to Iran. <clears throat> Due to political interests, not only they didn't cancel their flights, in some occasion, they increased number of direct flights from China to Iran for uh, some Chinese that they couldn't make to their final destination through UAE or Turkey. And as you know, uh, before coronavirus, there was some kind of mistrust between the society and the government after there was a demonstration in Iran that there were a lot of people, they got arrested, unfortunately. And after that, there was a flight which was shut down. 
uh, by the, uh, the uh, military of Iran. So after that, there was a mistrust. And when there was a kind of <coughs> uh, 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 misunderstanding about the situation of coronavirus, there were two uh, public occasion in Iran. One of them was the anniversary of the revolution. So the government didn't want to admit that they are facing the challenge of a coronavirus outbreak. And after that, you know, 10 days later, it was the uh, uh, parliamentary election. So they, their concern was that if they admit they have a coronavirus outbreak, that may discourage uh, people to come to participate. Even some of their followers belong to conservative parties. After that, the initial number surprisingly were, were among two death cases that we expect to have infected cases, which in a couple of weeks, two percent of them died. And then we saw why there was some recommendation by Ministry of Health to put the first city, which called Kho, which is a religious city in current time, but due to a controversy and, you know, uh, between uh, you know, policy makers and militia, they couldn't put you know, the, 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 the first city in current time. So it ended up every two, three days, they use different approaches and try to use uh, uh, the political interest more than the, the benefit of the society. And uh, a few days later, the, the president of the country said, oh, uh, starting in a few days, we can go back to the normal life. The next day, the minister of health said, no, we should, uh, we should you know, close all the schools. So there was a kind of you know, confusion among the society, what should we do? And before that, for several weeks, they tried to misinform the society that coronavirus is not important. <laughs> Uh, compared to influenza, so they try to undermine the significance of this issue. So if we look at the trend, you know, there is no single approach. Initially, they said we follow China approach, then said no, we follow Europe approach, and then say no, we follow UK approach, that we don't want to lock down the system. And later on, they said even UK is facing the huge challenge, they change their mind. Even today, why there are some you know, uh, official you know, numbers like 67, 8,000 you know, uh, detected cases and you know, over 3,000 deaths, but there are a lot of uh, on other reports that we can easily calculate, and I know Hajir can give us a very you know, better you know, way of you know, estimation that there are at least more than 200,000 infected cases. And unfortunately, during the past three, four days, if you see the uh, report of new uh, cases, the incidence rate, they want to sound that they are declining to support the argument of the President Rouhani that there is no problem, we can go back to work. But in reality, when they couldn't find twin, uh, uh, more than 20% of all infected cases, how should we expect that they can control the entire outbreak? So I am very you know, uh, uh, worried about the future of Iran because you know, they, they try to, you know, either make up the numbers or underreport the numbers or any other way to justify to say, okay, we are not facing the challenge. And as you know, you know, two, three weeks ago, we had the Persian New Year that more than 8 million people moved from bigger cities to the smaller cities, which means they brought the infection to smaller cities, which means in a couple of weeks, we expect to have another outbreak from uh, starting from a smaller city. So my a general observation is that still until today, why the Ministry of Health shifting from political decision to be non-political and more professional, and even they admitted that initially they were misinformed by initial data came from China, but still the rest of the government and uh, particularly you know, other you know, uh, political parties make very controversial decision and that's making people very confused. Thank you very much, Cameron. That was wonderful. A lot of the questions are linked to the issue of the impact of this health crisis on Iranian politics. Let me, uh, when I have that question, the opportunity to, uh, to add my own uh, question to that. Uh, the issue of politics in all of this. Um, you know this case better than I, when the, um, the nine uh, physicians and staff from um, uh, Doctors Without Borders showed up in Esfahan to set up that uh, field hospital with 48 beds. My understanding was that trip was organized by the Iranian ambassador in Paris and the foreign ministry, in other words, the Hassan Rouhani government. They didn't last long, as you know, and they were asked to leave because of security concerns. That was just one of those blatant examples of the politics of all of this. But today, 
You have people like the members of the, uh, or the outgoing deputy speaker of Majlis, Ali Mutahari, talking about how the Chinese ambassador has to apologize to some of the comments is made about Iran. So it's not just domestic politics, but it's also Iran's relations with a large important partner like China that is becoming politicized. What is your read into the politicization of this issue at this critical time for the nation? So that's a very good question. You know, the, the challenge is that the government realized they did mismanagement to control the coronavirus. And now they try to find some excuses, some internal excuses and some external excuses to the certain level that they are allowed. And given Iran doesn't have a centralized you know, uh, policy, so one part of the uh, government, like what you said, they try to criticize you know, China, but the other part that they have closer connection with China, they try to you know, blame those people that they wanted to criticize. And as you nicely mentioned about the uh, physician without border, definitely they were invited by uh, foreign ministers and also by the Ministry of Health and they were welcomed by the Vice Minister of Health, who is the Commissioner of Health in Isfahan. So that was very clear, that was the policy. But mm -hmm. then there was a concern later on came from the militia that maybe these doctors know the real number of how many they got infected, how many deaths, which goes beyond our control. I think that was the motivation that they, later on they decided to ask them not to work directly. And they asked them that you just work with refugees or immigrants, which shows the concern was not just the present inside the country, was the access to national data. And even you check hospitals, there are a lot of doctors that they are informed you are not allowed to know the total number of infected cases. And there are some reported that uh, to the same level that we have confirmed cases by coronavirus, we have confirmed cases by CT scan or other diagnostic approaches, but they are not considered as coronavirus. So that's the main concern of the government that initially a lot of experts, including us, we said, let's be open because the sooner you be transparent, later on, if you have achievement, even minor achievement, you can congratulate. The same way, if you look at the US, you know, initially there's no question, they didn't make very good you know, policy, but later on they admitted and they try to have a greater projection. So now we see when they have some minor success, they can congratulate themselves. Thank you very much, Kamyar. I'm going to turn to Hajir, but uh, the point you raised about secrecy, uh, we'll get to that uh, hopefully in the next round of questions, because it's, it's also tied to the issue of sanctions. Um, as you know, and I want everybody to think about this, the issue of sanctions right now is a hot potato, if you will, in all of this. Um, and if there are conditions attached to the US suspending or ending some of the sanctions on Iran as it deals with the crisis, it might be required of Iran to open up some of the books to be transparent. And I, that will be a very tough call for the, for the Iranian authorities since they, they prefer secrecy, since they don't trust the rest of the world as much. Hajir, I'm turning to you, um, to, to Kamiar's point, if you could develop that in terms of the estimates. I mean, what is in your estimation, these numbers obviously are constantly changing. I think we're about 65,000 officially infected, something like four, just over 4,000 have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. How realistic are these numbers and where do you see the trajectory going forward? Uh, thanks, Alex. Very important question. And uh, it is actually a very hard question because um, counting the actual number of COVID cases anywhere in the world is a pretty hard problem. There, is, there are multiple issues. There is the fact that a large fraction of uh, patients are asymptomatic, and that means they would not go to healthcare facilities and they would not be uh, subject to testing in most cases. Uh, we also have significant overlap between symptoms of COVID-19 and flu for cases that are not critical. And therefore, a lot of people would potentially have it and just say, okay, I probably just had a cold. Uh, a third problem is that once you have a serious outbreak, people will be fearful of going to medical centers and looking for uh, care because not knowing whether they have COVID or something else, they would be 
uh, afraid that they will actually contract the disease because a lot of patients with COVID condition are now concentrated in hospitals. So that reduces the incentives to go to the hospitals. And then fourth, and probably most importantly, the numbers that we get are limited by the scope of testing. So the testing capacity in different countries varies hugely. Uh, so today in the United States, we are testing uh, north of 100,000 people per day. Uh, Iceland has been testing about 1% of their population every day. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Iran, the total number of tests per day is not fully known, but it is in the range of six to 10,000 over the past uh, months or so, which is a very small number. And that is the bottleneck for the official statistics we said. So the statistics you reported, 60,000 total cases, 4,000 total deaths to date, is limited by how many tests actually has happened. So what we did in uh, collaboration with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Akbar Zadegan uh, from Virginia Tech, was to estimate a statistical model using three sources of data. First was the official data. We assumed the official data is not falsified, it is just coming from a process that is limited by the testing capacity. So the question is what test <laughs> cover Second, travelers from Iran that in the earliest stages presented COVID symptoms when they arrived in ports of entry outside of Iran, that gives us an estimate for what fraction of population might be infected. And a third source is that hospital systems in Iran have been collecting data and deaths from uh, suspicious COVID cases, which is different from the official reports. And that number has been occasionally leaked to the uh, news media. So BBC Persian had a report about that at the very beginning with 210 cases, and then Iran International had a couple other reports. So we combined these three sources of data using a dynamic model of how the disease spreads in the country and estimated the relevant parameters to say, okay, how well the hospital sources are counting these cases and how well the testing, official testing is counting the true numbers. And based on that, backtrack the true numbers. And what we found until March 20th, which is just before the Iran, uh, Iranian New Year, uh, was that the total number of cases in Iran might have been in the order of 1 million rather than the uh, 20,000 or so that was counted by that time. That is about 50 times more than the true num the official numbers. And the total number of deaths that we found was about uh, 15,000 that at the time, uh, the total death reported was in the 1400. So that was about 11 times the official numbers. Now there is huge uncertainties around these estimates and we are very clear in our paper, which is still not peer reviewed. So this is lots of uncertainty in the academic sense of it. But it seems that overall, there is about one order of magnitude undercounting of death that is coming from the statistics in Iran currently, and more than that in counting the total number of cases. So that is the big picture about what we think is happening inside Iran. Now, if you go from Iran to other countries, we do think similar uh, undercounting is happening, but at very different magnitudes. So if, for example, you look at Iceland, they probably are not having a lot of undercounting. South Korea also has done a great job of testing uh, at very high rates, and they also probably don't have a huge amount of undercounting. In the US, we are pretty sure there is significant level of undercounting, but whether that is an order of magnitude or 20%, uh, that needs more research, and that's not very uh, clear yet. So that's kind of a quick overview of the current state of understanding where actually we stand uh, with respect to the spread of the epidemic. And the short message is, it is probably much worse than the official statistics tell us. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Thank you very much, Ajir. I mean, look, you're right. Undercounting is a problem across the board, it seems. Uh, sometimes it's intentional. Other times it's not as intentional. Other factors are at play. In the case of the Islamic Republic, the issue of lack of transparency is a problem that predates this crisis by four decades, pretty much going back to 1979. 
We only have to look at what happened with the Ukrainian airliner in the days of not telling the truth to the public. So there's a real lack of trust, it seems to be still, uh, by the Iranian population when it comes to what the authorities are telling them. But I just want to quickly follow up. Uh, and I don't, I'm not in the business of being an alarmist, but if I heard you right, about 1 million cases by 20th of March. And Kamiar earlier on in his remarks talked about some 8 million people traveling for the no rules holidays. Now, this concentrated initially this uh, um, COVID 19 in Om, in Tehran, in Isfahan, later on to Gilan. But 8 million people, they weren't just going to those of four or five select destinations. So, in terms of modeling and help me figure out the data, how does this explode in a country of 83 million? And I mean, give us, again, give us a bad scenario, but maybe also a good scenario if you can. Sure. So, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that the travel inside the country will happen at a rate that ultimately will spread it beyond the original destinations. So unless, like China, you would lock down every city very quickly, it probably, there is not much leverage in reducing travel in terms of limiting the spread, because it will spread. And once you have to have policies that are covering the whole country. By just limiting travel, you cannot stop this epidemic. You may delay emergence in one city or another city by a few days. Uh, even the China's case, there is a good paper in science that shows that uh, it has probably contributed to two, three days delay in the emergence in other cities, the lockdown of Wuhan. Uh, so that is not a high leverage policy. The key issue is that one now that we have it is spread both inside Iran and pretty much everywhere else in the world, the question is what are the policies that are effective? And essentially we need to have significant physical distancing, bring down uh, social interactions very significantly and keep in that mode until we have an exit strategy. And unfortunately the exit strategy is not here yet. We need either a treatment or a vaccine uh, or maybe if you are very lucky, the virus mutates into some uh, more benign version that spreads fast and therefore gives uh, herd immunity to the population without uh, killing a lot of people. And none of those are immediate or even close. Uh, so the foreseeable future is if we do not follow social distancing and physical distancing and reduction in contact rates in any country, we will have significant risk of a spread. Now, there are a lot of uncertainties associated with weather's impact on uh, the epidemic, which may give a few months of reprieve uh, for various countries during summer, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but that will also go away when we are back into fall uh, winter season. Uh, so the short answer is if we don't do the significant physical distancing. And it seems that I Iran's policy has been vacillating between kind of doing it at some level and then saying, yeah, maybe we should go back to work. Um, and I understand there is a lot of economic pressure as well in that uh, space. Uh, but if we don't do it, it will spread and it will essentially infect the vast majority of the country. And that if that happens with the current uh, infection fatality rates that we are seeing across the world, which are north of 1%, especially if your healthcare system is overwhelmed, then uh, we are talking about mass casualties in the order of million uh, people in Iran and in many other countries will face similar, really challenging uh, situations. Uh, that's unfortunately what seems to be the most likely scenario if we don't do the significant uh, physical distance. Yeah. Thank you, Aju. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Nav Bahar. Uh, Nav Bahar, you just heard um, uh, some of the realities facing a, a large country to the south of the Central Asian states. And I know uh, Foreign Minister Javad Sarif spoke to his counterpart in Kazakhstan today. Um, there's been promises, if not delivery of aid from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan to Iran as it combats um, this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there are, as you know, interlinkages between Iran and Central Asia, um, uh, but at the same time, you know, in the case of Iran, initially what you heard was uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei saying that this crisis was a manufactured American crisis, that the virus was an American plot. 
and it kind of set the stage and it created confusion. It was, uh, again, to a point I've made repeatedly, pol politicized. Has it been politicized as a crisis um, other than health crisis in Central Asia? How would you put, uh, assess the overall performance of the five Central Asian states so far into this, uh, into this crisis? Well, thank you, um, Alex. It's a pleasure to speak um, at the Middle East um, Institute. And I have to mention that, you know, I, I cover the region. I, uh, I'm a proud voice of America journalist, but I'm not necessarily speaking on behalf of my organization, but rather sharing my own insights and analysis. The region, as you know, Central Asia being so influenced by Russia, uh, you know, especially when it comes to information, um, buys a lot of the conspiracy theories that, that spread, uh, you know, in that part of the world. So obviously you'll find even analysts, some intellectuals arguing the same, basically presenting the same argument that the, uh, uh, that the hominy, you know, may be talking about, that this is, this is somebody's work you know this is this is big politics at work but in general um we've been rather surprised pleasantly surprised by the responses of the uzbek government and also the the, the kazakh government because uh, until about mid-march uh, we kept on questioning how come there are no cases in the region you know china being so close and there were absolutely no uh, official cases nothing confirmed but by the mid-march uh, kazakhstan and uzbekistan started reporting cases and that sort of started a new phase in the life of central asia all of a sudden we saw authority is becoming more uh, transparent, uh, relatively more transparent, more engaging, uh, both with the media and with their own public, and also in a very interesting way, comfortable with bad news. You know, these are classic authoritarian regimes, uh, both in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. I mean, I'm, I'm going to focus more on these because these are two big countries in Central Asia. And um, it's, it's one thing to have a lockdown in an authoritarian regime, and perhaps we may think that it's easier to enforce quarantine and all the measures that are being taken, you know, in these societies. But it's also the other side of it is that, you know, people don't share bad news with authoritarian leaders, right? So we can always question the information that's coming out in, uh, from these countries. But within a month, now you have over 1,600 cases of infection. Uh, in Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, you have 14 confirmed deaths. Uh, so the largest number of infections and deaths uh, is in Kazakhstan. And Uzbekistan has now about, uh, Kazakhstan has nearly 800 cases, Uzbekistan has nearly 600 cases, and Kyrgyzstan, which is relatively free, the freest society uh, we still consider in the region, has about 300. So on a daily basis, you have governments reporting to the public about this, you have more officials talking and discussing, and the leaders have been uh, doing weekly addresses to the public, they've been promoting social responsibility, and, you know, the response, we could analyze it being is quite traditional. I mean, the number one priority has been to uh, ensure access to information, promoting, again, awareness and trying to calm the public. Uh, secondly, they have equipped hospitals and the medical centers with necessary technology, with staff. Uh, and thirdly, they have taken economic measures to really, uh, you know, avoid deeper economic crisis. The, the economies in the region are heavily dependent on Russia on China mm -hmm. and on the neighboring big powers. So, you know, they were, they were not in a very good shape to start with. And I mean, we can talk about this further, but obviously the biggest fear is this, that economically the region is going to suffer more following this or as we go through this, you know, coronavirus uh, period. Right. Actually on that point, which is something I, I wanna ask, ask uh, uh, Kamiar and Hajir as well, the issue of this sort of, uh, the social implications of all of this. In the case of Central Asia, because you mentioned Russia, China, I mean, I know Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are energy exporters, so is Turkmenistan, and the price of energy has dropped and it probably will stay low for in the foreseeable future. There'll be fewer dollars coming back to Central Asia from places like Russia in terms of remittances and so forth. So do you see a link here between this health crisis and political instability, in, at least in certain pockets uh, in, in, uh, in the region? 
You know, we we can't expect anything. I want to be really safe in terms of like prognosing, you know, what could happen next. Uh, we see approaching economic crisis for sure. And they, there are many signs of it. There are many warnings about it. Um, <clears throat> the, the countries, at least the regimes, have not yet coined the crisis. You know, when you listen to President Mirziyoyev, the, the, the leader in Uzbekistan, who is basically going, uh, you know, through the first real test, you know, for, I mean, he's been in power since late 2016, and many Central Asia watchers, including myself, have been saying that, you know, Mirziyoyev, uh, will be tested through some kind of a crisis. And um, and Qasem Jumar uh, Tokayev in Kazakhstan too, even though he's not new in the political system of Kazakhstan, he's a new president. So for both of these leaders, this is quite a test. This is a major challenge. And both of them so far have said that the virus came from China. It, it's an outside uh, you know, virus that it came from somewhere outside the country. So, and then they haven't necessarily said that this is a healthcare crisis. They avoid the, the use of the word crisis in general. So, you know, they, they call it a tragedy, they call it a challenge, a problem, an issue, global issue that everybody is going through, and that's Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. So you don't really hear much definitions of what is really going on politically, but, you know, in places like Kyrgyzstan, right, which has a small economy, heavily dependent on the remittances uh, from Russia, heavily and you have thousands of migrant workers stranded in Russia jobless now the remittances are you know the economic activity trade activities have slowed down um, this is a region that lives off its bazaars and you know small businesses there is a lot of informal economy across the region and mo most of that is uh, is basically has slowed down most of it is closed down now so that could lead to some kind of an instability, uh, you know, in the near future. Uh, but we can't say that for sure because we don't have enough information about this, uh, I mean, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And and secondly, more than ever, uh, and I can say this based on my conversations with both, you know, civil society and, and, and others in the region, um, people are listening to their governments more than ever. You know, governments are seen now as credible sources of information because it's about life and death, right? So it's really this individual safety, individual health. So the governments could use this to actually improve their own credibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nagahar. I'm going to switch gear a bit. I'm going back to, um, to Kamiar and um, I have a question on the issue of sanctions. Um, but Kamir, a very quick question came in here. I, I don't know if you have a quick answer. If you do, please give it to us. But the questioner is asking if there's a concentration of infections in Iran. If there's a particular place today that you say is more impacted than other places in the country. Sure, as you know, over the time that concentration you know, changed, but initially it was in Qom. And then, then since there was not a very clear progressive quarantine, you know, uh, they, the border cities were affected, like Tehran and northern part of Iran, like Gilan, Mazandaran, Golestan, and then uh, Markazi. But over the time, other major cities like Isfahan and others are getting affected. Since we don't have a very uh, uh, available test, as Hajir mentioned, so we have, you know, up to 10,000 tests per day, we cannot have a very clear you know, assessment. And even if we have those tests, they are more concentrated in major cities. So we don't have equal, equally distributed testing mechanism to make sure how is the trend change. But definitely, while initially they are in uh, major cities, my expectation is in two, three weeks, it will sh completely shift to a smaller cities. Great. Uh, Kamiar, let me turn to the question of U.S. sanctions. Obviously, that's a big issue here and in the region, obviously inside Iran as well. You have seen um, how any matter in the Islamic Republic can quickly become politicized. Uh, and on this issue of whether U.S. should, at this point, reconsider some of its sanctions on Iran, if there are smart ways of making sure that you don't just suspend some of the sanctions, but you actually make sure the, the money released 
or the medicines released will end up in the right hands. I mean, we're all sorts of stories about, you know, some of these are nothing but hearsay. Uh, certain factions within the Islamic Republic are hanging out to certain medicines to profit maximum at a later point and so on. So there are all sorts of arguments and counter arguments from all sides. But where does someone like you, who I know deeply cares about the healthcare system of Iran, and you've seen this, um, this political model in action, where do you stand on the US sanctions issue? So that's a very, <clears throat> I think, good question and definitely has a good answer. But the point is that whether when we consider those answers, do we have our own political agenda or not? So as you know, <clears throat> uh, there used to be limitation of availability of medical supplies, but two months ago, US tried to have more coordination with Switzerland Channel to make those uh, uh, medical supplies available. But the challenge is while they are available, they are not accessible. It's very important to distinguish between availability and accessibility. To make a just simple example, imagine there used to be no treatment for coronavirus in, in a pharmacies. But now they are there, but if I don't have health insurance, if I cannot afford why they are available, they are not accessible. So it will be pointless. So the challenge is that for example, there are a lot of non-for-profit organization in the US that they have OFAC license, which means they have approval by Treasury Department uh, for in the medical supplies to purchase a, a test. And they approach a lot of you know, companies, US-based companies, UK-based companies. They, those inquiries were denied. And this is the question, you know, because if you say initially, if Iran wants to purchase you know, uh, maybe US or uh, Western countries, the companies, they don't know how they can do transaction through bank, but how about this US-based organization that everything is based on US, everything is transparent, they get audits, there's no problem. But uh, still, after several weeks frustration, they couldn't make it happen. So imagine, now this is the reality. There's a huge need inside Iran. There is no question about that. Okay, as Hajir mentioned, there are hundreds of thousands they got affected. 10, 15, 20,000 they died. And this is not being finished tomorrow. It may take two or three more months. Okay. While from one side we say, okay, sanction is exempt for medical supplies. Technically, it's not. Second, when we say to Iranian government, oh, they may take advantage of that to you know, remove other sanction that may or may not be the case, but what is the other alternative option? Why, for example, European Union or UK or Canada or others, they don't provide those medicines. There's no question they are, these medicines are not produced inside Iran. Why they don't give those kits? As Hajir mentioned, there's a huge shortage of kits. And they need PCR. This is a de you know, device you need to have to do tests, OK? If we give them PCR, if we give them tests, if we give them medication, how about face mask, N95? It's huge shortage, which protects protect doctors and nurses. So my point is that there is a delay. You know, we have shared that. I talked to 60 major medias about this over the past two months. There is no significant you know, uh, measurements to, to say, OK, we don't want government has access to money. This is understandable. And this is our package. You know, we send you know, tests, we send medication. So we don't see the other options. So what will share this message with the people of Iran? Why most of the Iranian people lost their trust with the government. Mm -hmm. And these are some messages from US or European that they say, we care about people inside Iran. But in, 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 in practice, they are losing their family members, parents, siblings, daily basis. And there is a still shortage of minimum protection. So this will give a wrong message to the society. And imagine 70% of population of Iran are less than uh, 40 years old. They will make the future. So mm -hmm. they will never forget what they are going through. I think this is very critical time that the European Union, UK, US make a significant you know, decision immediately. And you know, we talk about corona, it's about two, three, four, six months. Make something tangible 
to prove to society inside Iran, because who is the most affected? The disadvantaged population, there's no question. They are starving every day. Give them food. I think there is no excuse to make excuse based on excuse of giving Iran's access to money, may use other, give them medical supplies. What they can do with medical supplies, what they can do with tests for COVID-19. Right. I'll, I'll love to come back to you and I would ask you to consider giving a piece of advice, a practical piece of advice to say someone like Secretary Mike Pompeo in terms of what he can do, because, you know, there are different ways of looking at this issue. And as I said, you've got to make sure the end user is a legitimate end user, that the money, uh, medicines is easier to argue for, but for instance, this $5 billion IMF loan, the fear in the region and in Washington is, how do you end up making sure that money goes to patients and not to some you know, activity somewhere in the region? But we'll come back to that. Let me quickly turn to Hajir uh, Kamiar. And uh, you have to really educate me on this one, Hajir, because I know you're working on this modeling uh, in terms of COVID-19 and the phenomena of weather. Tell us where you are in this re research. And you know, please, by all means, expand beyond Iran. What does that tell us, uh, what, what you've been working on in terms of um, uh, going forward, dealing, containing um, this health crisis? So I have been working on the problem, but I, I don't have clear answers from my own research, but I've been looking at what others have been doing. And there are multiple groups that are looking at the impact of different dimensions of weather on COVID-19 spread. And the short answer is we still don't know completely, but we are getting a more clear picture. And in that picture, it seems the kind of temperature band around um, 0 to 10, 15 degrees Celsius is the optimum zone for the COVID-19 transmission. And when you get out of that zone, the spread of the epidemic does drop down. And that might provide an explanation why in South Asia and Africa, we have had fewer cases so far uh, than we feared uh, could have overwhelmed those countries completely. Uh, it also provides, if that is correct, and I'm kind of cautious here because, as I said, this is not well-established and fully wetted uh, research, but uh, if this holds, then going into summer, uh, several countries in Middle East and some in Central Asia will see a reduction in the pressure of the epidemic. It doesn't, it will not stop the epidemic because not all of the transmission happens outdoors. So what happens indoors is not that much subject to uh, weather conditions and that will continue to spread the epidemic. This the epidemic will not go away, but the pressure will potentially come down if that is the case. That would be a temporary period. And for Iran, that might be between uh, late April, um, early May to September uh, range that they would have some time breathing room, you, you could say, uh, to get their acts together uh, for other countries, depending on what uh, their baseline temperature ranges are, it will vary. Um, but that will not solve the problem. Right. Me, well, I have to ask you a question that kind of links immediately to what you just said. And the, the question is, uh, is this modeling that you've been working on, this model system, has it been shared with anybody, including the Iranians? So the paper that we published on this extent of epidemic inside Iran has been shared publicly because it is available on Med Archive uh, preprint server. And it has actually received quite a bit of attention. Several media reports have reported on it. I'm, so I'm pretty sure that inside Iran, uh, people have had access to it and have looked at the results. It has been translated into Persian uh, by some uh, student groups. Uh, whether they are using it in any other way, I don't know. I don't have any direct access to the decision-making process inside Iran. After the publication, we have received uh, some reports from medical uh, experts in Iran and people in the healthcare system that have uh, shared their experience in terms of the actual number of deaths they have been seeing in hospitals compared to what their official reports are, which very much aligns with the uh, estimates that we had, that essentially an order of magnitude undercounting of deaths uh, in official data compared to the actual uh, what is happening on the on the ground. As I as I said, there are various reasons for that, and not all of it is by design. It might be just that they haven't been able to build up test capacity. I don't have any insight into that. Uh, right. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to Navahar. One of the questions is about regional cooperation. Um, so Navahar, how's the situation in terms of Central Asia, the five uh, Central Asian states? 
are they cooperating? Because sometimes, I mean, some of the news coming out of countries like Turkmenistan and Tajikistan has been very different. I mean, it, they've been, uh, let's say, similar to what we've been reading about happening in Belarus than what's been going right, on. Right, right. Proximity, yeah. I mean, you've got China and Iran next door with huge amounts of cases, and you wonder why there is this sort of um, difference in, in, in um, dealing with this problem. So where is regional cooperation on this? And actually, let me ask you to bring US, China, Russia, or anybody else you want into this question. Uh, and please, if you could be brief, a uh, couple sure. of minutes. Uh, it's a big question. I appreciate if you could be brief though, thank you. Sure. So Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, they both have lived up to the expectations of being the, one of the most closed societies, obviously, and they have zero cases. And they have been continuing um, you know, to hold public events, sports uh, events, and everything else, led by actually presidents themselves. So that raises a lot of questions, but we're, we're, we're getting zero cases from both of these countries. In terms of regional uh, cooperation, we have seen um, a lot of conversations between the leaders of three countries that I mentioned, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And President Mirziyoyev has definitely emerged as a, as a regional leader here. He's rallying. He's leading those conversations. He's the one who's reaching out to, to everyone, including Afghanistan. Because as far as Uzbekistan is concerned, Afghanistan is now part of Central Asia politically. So Afghanistan is the sixth you know, republic in, in the region. So there is a lot of engagement between these countries. Also, they've been talking to the Russians, uh, but they look at China as a model in every which way to, to counter this virus. So they see, because, you know, they're also more comfortable working with China because it's the biggest investor in the region, it's a big economic partner, and the governments are more comfortable in dealing, you know, with, with Beijing. So they have invited experts, they have invited professors, medical workers, they're getting equipment from China. So they're already working with the Chinese. And when it comes to the United States, it's been engaging the region more so, you know, over the last two weeks. Uh, they have provided nearly $5 million worth of uh, medical supplies to, to the region, uh, to all of them, including Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, by the way, because they want to counter any kind of uh, pandemic in these countries, even though they're reporting zero cases. And we hear the State Department uh, often mentioning the fact that they want to work very closely with the region. They're repackaging, they're repurposing the existing health programs to kind of cater to the current needs. So we see some movement here in Washington too. But in general, I would say that China is the country that the governments uh, in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan are looking at. To, to, to win this war against the coronavirus. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to that if there's time. Sure. Do, hopefully we have about 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. I wanna do another round. Kamiar, I, I asked you to think about something you could offer Secretary Pompeo in terms of what he can do practically that would help the Iranian people, that will help uh, United States in this PR battle against China and others uh, but that will not be monies or other resources that the Islamic can, uh, Republic can use in its regional activities, which as we all know, the United States is strongly opposed to in terms of Syria, Iraq, and support for, for other militant groups around the region. What, what do you think, is there something one can do out there that helps Iranian patients, people in need, but does not help um, the likes of the Revolutionary Guards? So that's a very good question. So based on my you know, opinion, there are some ways to do that. As I mentioned initially is to approach those major pharmaceutical companies or medical supply chain and assure them that you can provide those medical supplies to Iran with no problem. Because the main concern of those companies is that they may get very intensive audit after that for a few million dollars in you know, a transaction make it very progressive and aggressive audit. So that's first to be more proactive rather than passive. Second, provide some aid through medical supplies, medicines, you know, tests for COVID. There's no other usage for those things or ventilators. 
what's the usage of ventilators? If a, a patient ended up in intensive care, ICU, if you don't provide the ventilator, they will die. No question about that. Mm -hmm. So I think these things that they are immediately in need, they can be provided with no problem. That's first, okay? Second, when you see that a lot of countries in Europe, in uh, US, for example, you are spent you know, four billion do trillion dollars, you know, to provide you know support when you know the government asks people to stay at home, and they are providing fin financial support. Okay, if they think that Iran may take those loans or monies and use in other uh, you know uh, reasons that. I'm sure they may use. So the alternative approach is that, so when you want to provide financial support to people, what is the immediate need after accommodation is food because they don't do transportation, yes? They don't go to buy clothes and so on. So the major need is to feed their family members and children. Why they don't provide food? Through either the loan, make a condition that's a significant proportion of this loot, go to agriculture or food, or they provide food. So by this way, the government can provide a significant proportion of immediate need of people. Because as you know, due to sanction over the past three years, a significant proportion of population, they get under level of poverty. So they need to feed their family members. So if they get those kind of uh, supplies that they have no other you know, usage, I think that can be very important. And we are losing time. I know it's more than two months past. I think enough is enough. They have to make a clear assessment and say either we provide this, so they give no excuse to government mm -hmm. or give them alternative options. Right, thank you so much. Um, Hajir, uh, we have a question here. I don't know if you can help shed light on it, but I guess the questioner is asking really about the uh, spillover effect, the domino effect of this. I mean, Iran is the largest country in many ways. I mean, Turkey and Egypt are nearby, but Iran's been hit so far the hardest of 83 million people. You've got smaller neighboring states, places like Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, not to mention the smaller Gulf states. In terms of previous experiments or experiences with the spread of a, a epidemic or epidemic, uh, what what can we what can we expect? What is what is it? What does past trends tell us? Well, that's a very broad question. I think if we focus it on the spread of the epidemic itself, what we can tell is that no country is any more immune. Maybe there was a window of opportunity in the first <laughs> months or two that it could be contained within China, but we are well past that point. This is not going to end, and everybody is already infected. Whether they report the actual data or they measure it is a different question. But this is a spread all across the world. We are in it together. So cool. that's clear. The second question is, what's the magnitude going to be until we get to an endpoint? And as I said, the endpoint is not in sight yet. We still don't have any candidate vaccine that is working. Uh, maybe in six months, if we are very lucky, we may have something on the treatment or vaccine side. Uh, so at least for six months, but potentially for more than a year, we are dealing with a rising epidemic. And if we don't, each country has to make a hard decision about whether social distancing and physical distancing uh, can be sustained for that period. And sh they should do their best to do it enough that the epidemic doesn't infect everybody. Because if it does, we are talking about overwhelming of the healthcare system and death rates uh, more than two, three percent of the total population. And the economic loss from that human catastrophe is so large that overwhelms the economic loss from the lockdown. So that's an important distinction to make. We are not talking about economy and lives going into two different. Uh, policy conclusions. Uh, if you let two, three percent of your population die, you have lost so much in terms of future economic output uh, that it overwhelms the cost of not uh, reducing your GDP for that year. Uh, and the whole region will be affected one way or another, both because of the internal uh, epidemic and because the neighboring countries, their trade partners are weaker, uh, economic activity will go down generally.
Thank you so much, Hajir. I uh, have about five minutes left here, and I promise everybody in a, a hard uh, conclusion to our wonderful discussion here this morning. Navahar, I, I had my own question, and I have lots of other questions here, but uh, I'll try and put them together in one. But there is one specifically uh, for you on the issue of any discussions in, in Tashkent, in Nur Sultan, anywhere else about the release of political prisoners as a way of dealing with this crisis that we've seen in other countries like Iran and Turkey. Has that been on the agenda anywhere in Central Asia? Is that too sensitive, too early? The crisis hasn't reached that magnitude yet? <laughs> Um, no, there is no discussion. I have not heard from any government about this, but the, the prisons are closed completely. Nobody is meeting any of the inmates. Um, you can only contact an inmate uh, through a phone. So we know that relatives have been talking to them, um, you know, virtually, basically, uh, over the phone, but no, no discussions uh, of such uh, nature. Right. Yeah. And if I may ask you, because you mentioned China is the one everybody in the neighborhood is looking toward for solutions. Um, if I remember right, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was in the region just a few months ago. Yeah, early February. Right. Uh, to me, that suggests the U.S. obviously still has a strategy and cares about Central Asia. Um, but what would you suggest as a veteran watcher of the region and U.S. policy mm -hmm. towards Central Asia? What is, um, and bearing in mind, the U.S. has a huge crisis on its own to deal with. Exactly. On all levels. I mean, it's not that the U.S. has huge spare capacity right now. And, and, and I think there's a lot of political, um, obviously, arguments for focusing on home first before you go out there. But there is this competition with China. And in the case of Central Asia, what, what, what is the U.S. perhaps not, not doing enough right now that it hmm. could You know, Secretary Pompeo's State Department has been very critical and vocal about Chinese role in the region. Um, until him, we used to hear the same line from the State Department, which basically said that we're not involved in any kind of a great game. You know, we're not competing with any, uh, with Russia or China specifically. They are the big neighbors of the region. We're fine if they, you know, doing things well. Uh, but now you hear more criticism. There is a lot of mention of China in conversations with the Central Asian governments. So when Secretary Pompeo went to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan early February, he mentioned China a lot. And this was before the, the coronavirus you know, pandemic um, started, basically. And uh, the Washington renewed, updated its strategy towards the region right about that time. So I asked this question that you're asking me recently from Morgan Ortega, a State Department spokesperson, who basically said, you know, a part of our strategy is to fight transnational threats together. So pandemic is a transnational threat. So they basically, as I said, repackaging, repurposing some of the parts of the current um, <clears throat> Uh, strategy to 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 work with uh, Central Asia, but you're right. I mean, you know, when we talk about U.S. assistance to the region, people are very quick to respond by saying, "Hey, you know, we see what's happening in the United States. The country is fight, uh, is struggling more so than some of the Central Asian governments." I mean, I constantly hear from the Uzbeks that, "Oh, Uzbekistan has done so much better than the United States to counter uh, this virus." So I think there will be a lot of questions coming up about each time you mention U.S. aid, U.S. assistance. Of course, Central Asians welcome that assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan are, are, are open with wide arms. Uh, you know, they want assistance. They want aid. So if Washington wants to offer, they'll never say no. Uh, but they're also very realistic, you know, so you, you have $1 million worth of assistance coming, you know, to, to, from, from Washington, whereas China could be providing millions of dollars worth of assistance. So they get it. Right, right. Well, thank you so much, Navahar. I don't know if anyone has a last minute comment they would like to put out there to our audience who have been wonderful in sending lots of good questions. And I apologize for not having had the opportunity to ask every one of them, but you sent a lot of good questions, helped me along, and I've enjoyed this panel. Is there any last minute uh, comments from anyone? Go ahead, Navaharia. Yeah, yeah um, Alex, uh, you know, since this, this, uh, this web, uh, webinar has been focusing so much on Iran, I would like to say that the region watches Iran. 
you know it has diplomatic ties it has deep cultural historic ties as you know uh lingual ties and um so now that there is more focus on Afghanistan and Afghanistan being close to Iran, you know, there, Iran is very much a part of many conversations, but politically, you don't hear much, uh, you know, talk about this. Leaders do not openly discuss their views on, on Iran, especially sanctions, U.S. sanctions, Western uh, sanctions, but they're watching. And they obviously watched it with great concern as things uh, were getting uh, worse in Iran in terms of the coronavirus, you know, pandemic. So they're not ignorant of the region, but they don't want to kind of get involved into those big political international discussions. Thank you so much. Um, Tamiar, yeah. Joe, any last uh, minute? Sure. So I just wanted to encourage a lot of non for profit organizations that they care about health of people. This is the great opportunity, regardless of what is the political interest of their own uh, uh, government, to try to be more proactive. There are a lot of, right now, there are a group of several non for profit organizations based in the US or Canada or UK that they created a humanitarian relief coalition to provide medical supplies to the country in the Middle East, including Iran. And it's very important to consider that the coronavirus is not limited to the borders. If we don't protect one country, all other countries get affected. As you know, it started from a single case in China and became a pandemic. And you know, there are more than 12 countries, they, they, they first case of coronavirus came from Iran, which means if we don't provide those, you know, medical supplies or protection measurements, we can't control the pandemic. Thank you so much. Uh, Ajit, any last minute? Um, just one word, do more testing. It, we can't control something we don't understand, and that's very critical. And thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank all our wonderful three panelists here uh, on behalf of Middle East Institute and myself for joining us, taking the time to, to have this important conversation. I'll be lying to you if I said I wish we had, we had a more uplifting topic to discuss, <laughs> such is life. It's what we all have to deal with. Um, I, I learned a lot. I thank you for your expertise, your time. I hope you come back and join us. And I thank everybody who um, logged on today online to watch us on this virtual panel. Thank you all. And uh, with that, um, I say thanks again and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.